Um, okay, so we are starting our event today. Uh, I appreciate everybody for being here. Um, whenever we started this event, um, planning this event, uh, like three months ago, we didn't expect uh, it would fall on the shadows of the events that occurred in Florida. Um, but I think it is a timely uh, discussion that we are hosting today. Uh, I would like to, um, so yeah, I, I would like to welcome Jill, the Executive Director of Texas Gun Sense, uh, to lead off the discussion. Um, thank you. Okay, you promised my mic would be on when I started. Okay, thank you. That's my husband giving me hints up here. And he might do this, and then I'll... Um, anyway, Ed, Ed's going to be most, mostly your speaker, but I wanted to do some introductory remarks. Before I forget, there's some brochures and my card over there, and you all got the handout, which I think is very helpful, and then there's a gratuitous request for you to participate in Amplify Austin at the bottom, which is tomorrow and Friday. So um, tell your friends. I know you're, you're not rich uh, community college students, so tell your friends. Um, so I'm Jill, and I'm the executive director, and yes, it is Jill, even though it's spelled G-Y-L. I'm the youngest of seven. All our names begin with G, including my parents. So there you go. Um, now somebody's going to leave here tonight, and that's going to be the only thing you remember. That lady who was talking. Um, I started in August at Texas Gun Sense, so I'm fairly new. I'm going to use the new thing as long as I possibly can. Um, before that, I was five sessions, uh, nine and a half years as a mental health and substance use disorder advocate. So there's a lot of overlap on suicide prevention and gun sense, um, gun safety, et cetera. So I'm familiar with the topic, and, um, and I really am committed to it. Uh, you know, I tend to write my notes and not even mention the mass shootings because I'm just so disgusted and frustrated that I want to go forward. But I know some folks in here, um, probably personally affected, maybe some people from around Sutherland Springs. And so I want you to know that Ed and I in Texas Gun Sense are doing all we possibly can. And uh, I was talking to Francis, who's one, a board member who's one of our um, founders, the other day. And I said, well, you know, I, I just hope the kids can do what we've left undone. Not that I'm that old. And she said, you know, we have done a lot. And so I invite you to look at our website and to ask me questions at tonight, contact me, and there has been a lot of progress since Sandy Hook in particular. Our organization's five years old. It was founded right after uh, Sandy Hook. And before I forget, I'll mention Ed. Uh, Ed Scruggs is our board vice chair, and you've probably seen his face on television or heard him on the radio. He's been um, the committed spokesperson uh, and our board's volunteer, so he's been doing it all on his own nickel. Um, and he's going to answer the hard que questions because I'm new. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Austin School very much, Steve Langford. Raise your hand. There. We. He's emailed back and forth with us, you know, silly questions like where do I park? And so I appreciate it. Um, Ed's got this nice show, which I haven't seen, so I actually said we're low-tech, but you're not low-tech, Ed. I'm low-tech. Um, we encourage you to ask questions after. Uh, hand out about getting involved in my uh, card. Okay, so just a few things about Texas Gun Sets besides me and Ed. We're a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit organization, a 501c3. Our mission is to advocate for common sense, evidence-based policies that reduce gun injuries and deaths, not anti-Second Amendment. Absorb that, not anti-Second Amendment. We invite gun owners to be part of our solutions. Um, we're focused on statewide policy. We don't have the bandwidth to do local. Occasionally, we can send out a blast saying, contact your national legislators when, when there's an issue important to Texas. Um, but we, we try to focus on the state. We, um, let's see, our website's full of information. Da, da, da. I, Ed's good at saying, has taught me to say we're the only Texas-based nonprofit solely focused on gun sense in Texas. Um, we also run the Texas Coalition for, to Reduce Gun Violence, and we're planning to ramp it up pretty soon. Um, so... There's some information on the handout, and you can um, RSVP 
when you get the information about that. All right, now I have a quiz. Oh, it's on my phone, actually. Don't feel bad if you don't know these answers because I didn't really know them too much either. All right. Approximately how many people whoops, are shot in America each year? And you get choices. 1,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000. 1, 10, 50, 100. I'd say? 100, very good. Well, not very good, but you know what I mean. Um, of the people shot each year in America, how many are killed by gun violence? 350, 3,500, 35,000, 50,000. So of the people shot each year in America, how many are killed by gun violence? That's a weird, weirdly worded question, isn't it? 35,000, I'll give it to you since it's weirdly worded. Approximately how many people in Texas die each year because of gun-related injuries? 50, 1,200, 2,700, 3,200. So these are people in Texas who die because of gun-related injuries. Are, are y'all getting credit for your class? Because I'm going to report that you were not participating. 3,200. So 3,200 people each year. It, uh, whoops, wrong question. Uh, people in Texas who die each year because of gun-related injuries. Okay, I'll just do one more because this one is close to my heart from my former job and my current job is what percentage of gun deaths are by suicide, and this is Texas, and national stats are the same. What percentage of gun deaths are suicides versus murders or unintentional shootings. Oh, I should give you choices, shouldn't I? Um, 5%, 18%, 63 63%, 72%. Oh, aren't you smart? I heard 63. It is 63%. A lot of people are surprised by that, but not you guys. So I'll get out of the way, Ed will present, and then Ed will answer the hard questions. After that, I'll answer the easy ones. If you want to take a Oh, yes. Okay. That. Hello. Is the mic on? Is it working? Sounds like it's working. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Ed Scruggs. I'm the vice chair of Texas Gun Sense and a Spokesperson, I've been involved with the group for about three years. Um, my involvement in this issue was directly tied to the shooting at Newtown and Sandy Hook Elementary School. Um, I'd been disturbed by events before that, especially the Aurora Theater shooting, and uh, just thought, oh, there's nothing we can do. But Newtown sent, just set me off. Uh, it had an effect on me. I had a daughter the same age who was in the hospital at that, that morning. And uh, I will never forget um, on my phone the uh, Facebook post about there were two shot at a Connecticut school. And then I thought, oh, wow. So my daughter's in recovery, so I go to the cafeteria. And then on my way back, I come by the nurse's station and, at Dell Children's, and all of the nurses were in tears. And I thought, oh my gosh, did someone die? And, and I asked, is some, did something happen? And the nurse turned around and looked at me and she said, did you hear about what that man did? And I thought, oh boy. So then I looked on my phone. And at that time it was maybe seven or eight first graders. And then 12, 14, 16, 20. And it was an awful, awful day sitting in a hospital room with my daughter who was ill seeing pictures of children the same age who had just been murdered. So this had an impact on me, and um, I'd been involved in activism and politics here in Austin and gradually kind of fell into with a group of people online from Austin who were very upset at this, and we had no group to turn to. We had nothing we could do. We all kind of came together and formed a little hodgepodge group, and we had a rally at the Capitol a few weeks later. We managed to get 200 people there, and out of that group of people, it morphed into some groups you may be aware of now, um, Every Town for Gun Safety, Moms Demand Action, 
There were some Texas Gun Sense folks there. And um, so the issue's just always been close to my heart, and, and I was really thankful when they asked me to come on the board. But So I, I, it, it's a hard road in this line of work because, as you know, these things keep happening. And so you, you, lose, your, you lose your will, and then you get it back. And then you get disheartened, and then you get it back. And, and it's just up and down and up and down. But we've been making some progress over the years in a state where people will tell you, oh, you're wasting your time. No, you know, everyone loves guns and taxes, and you're, no one's going to hear you. But we are being heard, and events like this is evidence that we're being heard. We couldn't even get things like this when we first started. So thank you to the, uh, to the school for having us, and thank you so much for taking time uh, to show up today and listen. Um, of course, the Parkland, Florida shooting has floored everyone, and this comes on top of all the other shootings that we've had. And I can tell you from the time that I've been involved in this, this is different. Uh, we have reporters calling every single day about this still. Uh, that's not the case. That wasn't the case after Las Vegas or Sutherland Springs even. And so something is shifting. We don't know what. But um, I have basically I thought I would just pick a few topics of interest in this field because I know you'll have questions. And so I just thought about some things we could talk about that might be of interest to you. And I think mass shootings is a topic that a lot of people are um, very, it, it, it's a door that opens a lot to the issue here because it strikes everyone hard and um, on a psychic level. I know it did me. And... Um, most of you probably realize that this modern phenomenon began here in Austin, Texas. Right. We now have a report. He is definitely under the clock on the south side. Yes, we can see the movement. We just saw a puff of smoke. He fired again. It's a battle now. It's a battle between the sniper and the police. That battle would last a total of 99 minutes on August 1st, 1966, the day 25-year-old UT student Charles Whitman went on a shooting rampage from on top of the University of Texas Tower. More ambulances are screaming up and down the university drag. Sixteen people, including Whitman's wife and his mother, were killed. Students, teachers, even a boy riding his bike were gunned down by the sniper's bullets. Thirty-one others were wounded. And I saw him aiming the rifle in that direction. This man helped put an end to the nightmare. Former Austin police officer Ramiro Martinez was just 29 years old when he, along with fellow officer Houston McCoy, climbed to the top of the tower and shot the gunman. And he fired, and that time he spun, and that's when I reached up, got his shotgun, and I charged, and I fired one more shot. The massacre had ended. As Whitman's body was being carried out, people came out from all over, just as they are coming out today, asking the same question, why? So, 50 years ago, this began. Um, when this crime occurred, it rocked the world. No one thought that this was possible in the United States. And for a long time at UT, no one talked about this because uh, there was embarrassment, there was shame involved, and finally, last year, the university did put up a memorial to the victims. I met several of them, including Claire Wilson James, who um, lost her seven-month-old baby who was shot um, right there on the South Mall, right below the tower. Um, if you ever get a chance to stream the film Tower, the documentary on Netflix, it is a spectacular film where they take archival footage and they rotoscope animation over the top, and it really is a powerful film. So if you get a chance to see that, please do. But that was 50 years ago, and, and we had shootings following after that, of course. This, of course, was almost ancient technology compared to what we have today. The police were not prepared for this. There was no such thing as a SWAT team. They couldn't reach him. They even tried getting up in a crop duster airplane, but they couldn't get a shot off. Um, People got their handguns, their deer rifles, they shot at him, and it went on and on and on for over an hour and a half before he was finally taken out. Today, our mass shootings are very short and very quick and very deadly, um, especially when you consider the time. Can you come here for a second? 
Sorry about this. We're not that high tech. <laughs> I'll work on it. Filibuster. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Now, just quickly, the five deadliest mass shootings in the history of the United States, uh, and we've had several of them happen just in the past few months. Sutherland Springs, just down the road here, 26 people killed, 20 injured. The shooter had a history of domestic violence and child abuse and was convicted of that in the Air Force. His weapon, an assault-style weapon, AR-15 style weapon, he bought at Academy. He lied on his background check because the Air Force never reported his domestic violence conviction, which was a huge mistake and which there's legislation out there to try to fix that. The shooting time was a total of seven minutes. The shooter fired 400 rounds of ammunition. Um, he, was ki he killed himself after a chase with a good Samaritan who fought, shot back at him as he was outside the church. They went on a chase. He had been shot. He decided to kill himself before um, the police could catch him. Of course, this was, no one thought something like that could happen in that town. A lot of people carried, there were people in the church that carried in the church. They just didn't happen to be there that day. And I still think this small town, it's going to never be the same. New town, of course, Sandy Hook Elementary, December 14th, 2012. 20 children, ages 6 and 7, 6 educators and staff. Uh, the shooter's mother, he murdered her that morning and took his own life. He had a Bushmaster AR-15 and other handguns as well. The shooter was 20 years old, had a long history of mental and emotional problems, was never institutionalized, was never declared incompetent by a court. Um, his mother had a stockpile of weapons in the house. He was able to access her gun safe, and he used those weapons to murder her and murder the children. Virginia Tech, April 16, 2007. Now, this is different. 32 people were killed in a number of locations. This is different because he didn't use an AR-15, but he used a semi-automatic pistol, a few of those actually, with hollow point bullets. Uh, he fired 170 bullets in 10 to 12 minutes. He barricaded the, um, he actually chain shut the entrances and exits to the building. Um, went up to the second floor and walked in classes and pretty much had an element of surprise there before he shot. A very good friend of mine, John Woods, who fought Campus Carry here in Texas, his girlfriend was on that floor and he walked right up behind her and shot her in the back of the head. She was one of the first victims, never knew what happened to her. Um, this, of course, was when you talk about the age of the mass shooter and a media sensation, the, the shooter filmed a video of himself that he mailed to NBC News, pointed a gun to his head, rambling on and on, and they ran it all night long on the news. And I'll never forget that, how disturbing it was. Interesting thing about this case he had, of course, a severe history of mental illness as a teenager. At Virginia Tech, while he was a student, he was convicted of stalking two female students. But the court never informed the school of that. He was ordered by a judge to seek treatment because he was ruled to be mentally ill. They didn't enforce it. He didn't have to be institutionalized. He shouldn't have been able to buy a gun, but there was a loophole in state law saying that unless you've been institutionalized, you are able to buy a gun, so that's when he bought the murder weapons. He bought one, and then a month later went back and bought the other one. This led to somewhat of an overhaul in the background check system. It's, it shocked many, many people that this was allowed to happen. And they spent about a billion dollars upgrading the um, background check system, but as we see, it wasn't enough. Pulse nightclub, June 12, 2016, 49 people killed, 50 wounded. Uh, AR-15 style rifle plus a Glock 17 9 millimeter pistol. Uh, the motivation for this, there is debate. He was having some relationship issues, apparently it had some domestic violence background, but also during the shooting he pledged allegiance to ISIS on 911. <laughs> Uh, so we don't really know exactly what happened there. But this was, I'll never forget, I was on, in a car on my way to Minnesota on vacation. And again, reading the text coming over. 10 killed, 15 killed, 20 killed, 30 killed. And when it got over 40, I couldn't believe it. And then finally it stopped at 49. 
Um, this had, of course, it was on the news forever, and there were lots of calls for action, but nothing really happened for this one. The, the um, shooter kept people hostage for hours. He was killed when police came in to end the standoff. Um, most of the uh, victims were gay. This was a gay nightclub. There was some speculation possibly this was a hate crime, but that was never proven either. But it's a horrible, horrible crime that until recently was the deadliest mass shooting. Then we have Las Vegas, the outdoor country music concert outside the Mandalay Bay. 58 killed, 500 injured. Uh, the shooter took a position in the 32nd story of the hotel 200 yards away. They found 23 firearms in his hotel room, including 12 AR-15 rifles modified with bump stocks to become fully automatic. And we'll talk about bump stocks in just a bit. Uh, some of his ammo included military tracer rounds. 64-year-old um, shooter, he purchased the weapons from gun dealers and shows around the country, purchased his bump stocks around the country and online. No history of mental illness, no sign of a motive, which is confounding the FBI and investigators. Usually there's a clear motive here. We don't know why he did it. He obviously had practiced this for a while. Um, a neighbor of mine, I live in Circle C in Southwest Austin, she was shot square in the back and uh, would have died, but a good Samaritan in a pickup truck drove in and was scooping up people and throwing them in the back of the bed of the truck, and that's how she got to the hospital and lived. Um, uh, this was just an all-out massacre. This was, it, it's unbelievable, the scale of this. Um, but when we talk about the scope of mass shootings across the country, it depends on how you define mass shooting. The FBI for years has defined that as a shooting where four people die. Um, if you look about the true mass shooting effect, if you define that as shootings where at least four people were shot and injured, excluding the shooter, we have had 1,624 mass shootings in 1,870 days. That runs from 2013 until um, Valentine's Day this year. Killing 1,875 and injuring 6,848, and that's from U.S. News and World Report. Now, that is a lot of people, and granted, that is a very small percentage of the actual number of people who die in gun violence, as, as Jill said, 33,000 a year. Um, uh, it doesn't touch suicide, gang violence, crime violence. But these types of shootings have an effect beyond just the casualty. It really, it's, it's a form of domestic terrorism. It's horrible. But that gives you an idea of how common it is. We don't even hear now on the news sometimes when four people are shot. Or maybe four people are shot and they were injured badly, but we lived and it doesn't even make the paper or the news. Uh, it's just becoming uh, more and more prevalent. <clears throat> now, bump stocks. You may have heard in, when we talk about possible legislation in the wake of the Parkland, Florida shooting, one of the things that there is some agreement on is outlawing bump stocks. <clears throat> it's important to understand what a bump stock is and what it does. Uh, this is a YouTube video that's had a lot of um, hits, so some of you may have seen it, but I haven't really seen a better illustration to show you what a bump stock is and what it does. Uh, this is a guy who, um, he's, he's an enthusiast, he shows off uh, his collection and so forth, but in a very even-handed look at a bump stock. So today's video is going to be a little different and slightly more serious. There's been a lot of talk in the news lately about something called a bump stock. Now where I live in Utah, shooting guns is a fairly recreational activity. I would say Texas, Utah, and Idaho have plenty of guns distributed between the general population and it's kind of like a hobby thing. People go out to shoot guns, it's even a great date idea, and I have owned plenty of guns in my life and my family and it's just kind of like part of the custom and part of the culture. But lately there's been something in the news called a bump stock and how it attaches to a semi-automatic rifle. Now I've never used a bump stock before, but I am curious as to how easy it is to install, what's it made of, and what it can actually do. So yesterday I went out and bought an AR-15. 
This particular setup is about 1500 bucks. I walked into a local sports store, picked out the gun I wanted, they did a background check, and I walked out of there. So the thing about an AR-15 is that it's pretty customizable. You can swap out the barrels, you can swap out the lowers, you can put scopes on the rails, you can swap out the back stock. And this stock part is what we're gonna be talking about today because the bump stock replaces the handle of the gun and the stock of the gun and allows you to fire at an automatic rate with a semi-automatic weapon. I'll explain what those mean in a second. So while I'm pretty familiar with guns, I am not a gun expert by any means. I literally just bought this gun yesterday and this video is purely to just see what a bump stock is capable of doing. After major tragedies like the one in Las Vegas or the one in Texas, People call for stricter legislation on guns in general, and particular these bump stocks. But only by learning about them and knowing what they're capable of can we make the most educated decision. I was able to purchase a bump stock of my own. These are available online from multiple websites and local classifieds. This one cost me about $400, so we're going to install it on the AR-15 right now and see what it can do. So right now we're going to shoot this several times. Right now the bump stock is not in place and we're going to see how many rounds we can get off without the help of a bump stock. So this gun is semi-automatic, so every time I pull the trigger, there's gonna be a bullet leaving out the end of the chamber. So I'm gonna cock back the gun. That puts a bullet into the chamber. Safety is now off, and I'm ready to fire. That was relatively quick. So this is a 40 round clip. And so every time I pull the trigger 40 times, I can lose all the ammo inside of that clip. And that was pretty fast. You can get a lot of shots off in a pretty short amount of time. So now let's install the bump stock. And as a noob, I've never shot with the bump stock before. We'll see if it's possible to shoot faster than it is with just the straight trigger. So how a bump stock works is actually incredibly simple. The gun slides around inside of the stock and uses the recoil of the gun to shoot more bullets. This piece is pretty important. I'm a right-handed shooter, so I use my right hand to pull the trigger. And so I'm gonna take this piece of plastic, slide it onto the gun, and it blocks the trigger on one side. So when I grab the gun, I rest my finger on that piece of plastic on the far side, and then using the gun, I can pull forward with this hand. My finger connects with the trigger, pulls it, and then the gun will bounce back and forth, and each time it hits my finger, it'll shoot another round. And since the gun is doing it all automatically, it can pull the trigger faster than I can pull the trigger. Hence the full auto function of the bump stop. So these are the bullets right here. We have a 5.56, five, and it's just a whole box of these things. These things are about 40 cents a piece. So I also got these clips. These clips hold 40 rounds. They're about $20 each, and I can take the little bullets and just pop them into the top. And then the whole clip just slides into the gun when you're ready to shoot. This is my first time shooting with a bump stock, so we're gonna see how it goes. I got the clip in place. The stock is functional. Safety is off. We're loaded. And uh, let's see how this works. All right. Okay. <laughs> That was, that was faster than I expected. <laughs> okay, so that shot much faster than I anticipated, obviously. And uh, each time I shoot one of these clips, by the way, it's about 16 American dollars, 16 US dollars. So it's a lot of ammo going very, very quickly. What we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna do it one more time, but this time we're gonna shoot it in slow motion using a Galaxy S8. And you can pay attention to the stock and the trigger and watch how the gun is recoiling inside of the bump stock so we can get a better idea of how it works. So watch here as my hand pulls forward on the barrel of the gun. This brings the trigger up to my stationary trigger finger. My finger never moves, but still connects with the trigger due to the forward motion of the gun. The gun then fires, and the recoil brings the gun back to my stationary finger over and over, causing the trigger to be pulled again and again, very quickly until I run out of ammo. Accuracy is severely compromised, but accuracy isn't really the point of full auto. Here's the semi-auto firing rate one more time. My finger was pulling the trigger manually, and here it is again with the currently fully legal bump stock installed on the AR-15.
I'll be pretty honest, I'm pretty blown away with how well the bump stock works and how much ammo it can throw out of the gun as fast as it did. I was not expecting that. Now as far as all the controversy goes, I'm not going to jump into that on this channel. Personally, I think that you know guns are a great hobby, but not everyone in the world is sane, and they can turn something good and fun into something absolutely terrible. Not just with guns, but with cars, vehicles, anything can be turned into something bad. Like always, you're more than welcome to comment about this stuff in the comment section right below this video, but make sure to keep it a conversation and not an argument. Let's keep it constructive and productive. So even though this video was quite a bit different than what I usually do on this channel, I think it was interesting and useful. Knowledge is power, and now we know what bump stocks are capable of, what they can do, and we can make more educated decisions on whether they should be banned or just kept in existence. Let me know what you think down in the comments, and keep it constructive and not destructive. We're here for the conversation. Thanks a ton for watching, and I'll see you around. Okay. All right. I Thank you, David. It. Thank you. That's all right. Yeah, I know. I'm going to be lost without you. But yeah, that was an illustration of what a bump stock is. And as you can see, the differing fire rates there, and that's the sound you heard in those videos of Las Vegas coming from that hotel room. Um, and he had many of them. So he, he was very well off. He could afford them. They are perfectly legal. Um, and why this is an issue, it all came about from the banning of machine guns, or like the old Tommy guns that the gangsters used to carry. Back in the 30s, it was a problem. So the 1934 National Firearms Act banned those things. Um, and in 1986, it was updated, where they banned the production and sale of full auto weapons. Um, you were allowed to keep the ones made prior to 1986. They were grandfathered in. So really, a fully automatic weapon is not supposed to be something under the spirit of the law. So this was the way they got around that, was to build this. And in 2010, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms ruled that bump stocks um, are devices. They are not guns, so they do not violate the federal law because they're attachments to the gun, and they're not the gun itself. So that was a green light to produce more. <clears throat> um, the devil's in the detail with these. Uh, they belong to a class of attachments that people can refer to as multi-burst trigger activators, which convert a semi-auto to a full auto. In addition to bull bump stocks, there are other devices. Um, hellfire trigger systems, trigger activators, crank activators, where you can shoot with a metal crank so it it's kind of like a Gatling gun, I guess it's supposed to be. There's also something that some people refer to as the trigger happy glove, which is a glove that you wear that has a mechanical device on the end of the finger, which pulls the trigger for you. They're coming up with new ways for this all the time. California is the only state to ban all of these devices, and that was in 1990. Five additional states have restrictions, including the state of Washington, which passed those this week. Six states ban assault weapons, so under the spirit of the law, that would probably include that. But um, when you hear them talk about banning bump stocks, that's not the full conversation. They need to ban all of this category of attachments or it's not going to work. So um, to ban all of those, that's probably going to take an act of Congress. Um, so when you're hearing the news, pay attention to that. Because if they're just saying bump stocks, is that what they mean or do they mean something else? Now, we talk about prevention of these shootings. What tools are available? People call for banning assault weapons. People call for many other different things. But there are actually some very simple things that we can do, and we've actually lobbied for these here in Texas. And a very popular one that's gaining um, some bipartisan support is um, called a gun violence protective order. Nationally, that's what it's called. We call it the lethal violence protective order. But this is a tool that very likely could have stopped the Parkland, Florida shooting. This, this kid was mentally ill and violent, attacked his mother, attacked neighbors. Everyone was afraid of him. He'd been, police and deputies had been called out to the house many, many times, but he hadn't really done much. I mean, he'd pointed a gun at someone, and then the police get there, and they say, we don't want to press charges, et cetera, et cetera. But... There needs to be a step, because police are powerless a lot of the times to do something about this. There is a step that we can give families to request 
an action that might, um, might prevent some of these shootings. Every day, gun violence impacts communities all over the United States. Here in California, you could help prevent these tragedies by requesting a gun violence restraining order, or GVRO. Step one, identify a loved one in crisis or an individual at risk of dangerous behavior. Step two, contact your local county clerk or your local law enforcement to start the GVRO process. Step three, a preliminary hearing is held. If the judge finds the individual you identified is a threat to themselves or others, the court may issue a temporary 21-day GVRO. The individual in crisis will not be permitted to possess or purchase guns during this time. Step four, a second hearing will be held. The individual in crisis may attend the hearing. If necessary, the judge will extend the GVRO up to one year. The individual can seek help for their at-risk behavior and could request to terminate the GVRO if they no longer pose a threat. If they still pose a risk of danger, there could be a petition for another one-year GVRO. For more information on the GVRO and how to request an application, visit speakforsafety.org. This website does not provide legal advice, and information is intended for general informational purposes only. If you need any legal advice, please contact an attorney directly. Now that's a public service announcement in California. Um, uh, announcing, oh, we got it stuck. Hmm? Um, okay. Um, that law was, California was the first state to institute a law of that kind of breath. And that came about because of a mass shooting that happened at the University of Santa Barbara. Uh, I know the father of one of the victims. Um, his name is Richard Martinez, and he's become an activist as well. But we had a, a case there with a teenage shooter, very disturbed, violent person who was severely depressed and suicidal. And he was making videos and posting them to, to YouTube about his fantasies of killing people, pointing the gun at his head, all of these things. His family called the police, said, please come and get my son. We're afraid of him. We're afraid for him. Police came and they said, ma'am, he's 18. We can't do anything. He hasn't done anything wrong yet. And um, shortly thereafter, he went driving out through the student area of Santa Barbara and uh, believe he shot and killed 10 people uh, before um, shooting himself. So a tool like this is, was t is tailor-made to handle that situation. And, and um, again, it's not something that would be used all the time, but that is something that they could have possibly used. Um, it is meant for people with a history of violence and mental illness, with threats to themselves or others. Um, during these numerous incidents that involve sheriff and police in Parkland, Florida, for example, they could have tried to enact this as well. They could have informed the family, hey, you have this option where we could do something. Um, the shooter's guns could have been held in a court while the shooter received court order evaluation and treatment. In Parkland, this young man uh, refused to take his medication once he turned 18. He wouldn't go for therapy. He wouldn't go for treatment. No one could make him go. But if he wanted to get his guns back at some point, he would have had to go. And, and obviously, he needed probably institutionalization or hospitalization. So this could have fed him into the help that he needs. Um, and again, after evaluation and treatment, once the judge deems them competent, they, they can get uh, their guns back. So um, this is something that we are really pushing in Texas. Five states have this now, California, Connecticut, Indiana, Oregon, and Washington. Similar laws are proposed in 18 states, including Florida. Um, in the 2017 legislative session, um, Texas Gun Sense supported what we call the Lethal Violence Protective Order, uh, and in spite of the bipartisan interest, the bill was left pending in committee, and it didn't go anywhere. Um, there are some gun rights activists here in the state and in other states that vehemently oppose this idea. They feel that it is an unconstitutional taking of their rights and that it is prohibiting individuals from de defending themselves um, while um, they have the restraining order against um, their guns. Uh, so that has a lot of play here in the Texas legislature. So very, very hard to get past that. 
It was the first time that we'd actually brought this bill up. So we're committed to bringing it up again next session and bringing it up every single session afterwards until we at least get some committee votes and get it heard on the floor. Often in Texas, a good idea takes three, four, five sessions before it becomes law since they only meet every other year. But you heard, if you watched the Parkland Town Hall the other night, Marco Rubio voiced some support for this. Tim Scott, the, the governor of Florida, has voiced some support for this. Even Trump has voiced some support for this. But it's really a law that's probably going to be passed on the state level. Uh, we feel that this is a very sensible move that respects people's rights. It's a legal process. Uh, I mean, there would need to be a hearing and there would be need to be evidence to act on this, for example. And so I think this is a primary tool to combat um, not only mass shootings, but also suicides. And few people realize that many of the mass shootings where it involves more than four people, that grows out of domestic violence, where um, one spouse shoots the other and then kills the kids. We even had a case uh, last year up in, I believe it was Grand Prairie, up near Dallas. They were uh, Dallas Cowboys football watching party. And the couple had split up, and they always had football watching parties, and she was having the party at her house, and her ex did not like that. So he brought the AR-15 to the house, and he killed nine people, including her, and he was eventually gunned down by police. So uh, domestic violence is at the root of a lot of this um, either child abuse or domestic violence between spouses. So that's why a tool like this, we feel, um, could be a viable way to at least make inroads. I did an interview with someone the other day um, from Hearst Newspapers who said, hey, since California enacted the law, it's only been used 69 times. And there's 20 million people in California. And my response was, true, but I bet the 69 families that were involved in that are pretty thankful. And we don't know what we averted by using the law 69 times. As we've seen, it, all it takes is one to cause a lot of damage and hurt to the country and to the world. So at least having that option out there is something uh, I think that we can look towards. Um, one other option, I'll just talk quickly about background checks because I don't have slides on that. But most people believe that if you go to buy a weapon, you have a background check, it's an instant thing, you pass it, you get your gun. True, but also not true. Um, if you go to a licensed federal dealer, like at a gun shop, um, you will fill out your paperwork, they'll run your check. If you have a criminal history, drug convictions, felonies, uh, domestic abuse convictions, uh, mental illness that has where you have been institutionalized or found incompetent by a court, that's going to show up in the instant background check, and they either have to hold the weapon until it passes or they give it to you. But there are many, many ways around that. Not all weapon sales are subject to background checks. Um, at gun shows, they have licensed dealers there, but some gun shows have tables where people are selling their own collection one-to-one, -one. you don't have to do a background check there or even do an ID. You can go out in a parking lot. Um, you can go in the parking lot of Walmart with someone that you've communicated to on Craigslist and exchange an AR-15. No background check at all there. Um, <clears throat> also, to family transfers, like a parent handing down a gun to a child or something along that line, that's not subject to it either. But, but we feel if we included a, a poll show, I think there was a poll this week, 97% of Americans favor universal background checks. Um, it would catch more people in the system. I think it would just more people would take a breath before they go out and, and get these weapons. But of course, the checks have to work and the system has to work. Another piece of legislation proposed, you've heard the Fixed Nix Act, which is actually proposed by Senator John Cornyn here in Texas. In the wake of Sutherland Springs, where that shooter, he actually crushed or, or cracked the skull of his two-year-old child, and he was convicted of that while in the Air Force, was discharged. <clears throat> the Air Force did not report his conviction and sentence to the background check system. And so when he came here, he applied for um, an open carry or concealed carry gun permit, and he failed that. 
They won't tell us why he failed that. It may be because he was honest on his application, something. So after that, he goes down to academy, and he lies on his test and says he's never been arrested or had a felony conviction. And sure enough, they hadn't reported it. So in the computer, it looks like he's fine. So he got his weapons that way. Um, the Fix Nix bill would offer incentives for the armed services to report these. Since it's come out, they found thousands of these that were not reported in the system. Also, other states and government entities, they, under the current law, they are not forced to report these records. And it's really uneven across the country. Texas does a pretty good job. Recently, they upgraded theirs, and they've reported um, thousands of people to the system. But a few years ago in Oklahoma, they did a search of how many people in Oklahoma had been to reported to the system, and it was three in the entire state. That's because they allow individual counties to be in charge of the reporting in Oklahoma. It doesn't go to a central health department. So the counties weren't reporting. So they're working on changing that there. So that's what, we have a background check system, but not everyone is required to report. Um, some people consider that an unfunded mandate or it's expensive or some people just like, don't like to do it or there's resistance. But that's one thing we need to fix and go back and try to fix again. And I think we can do it. Um, that is a way to fix the system and we, ha we have the people who should have guns having them on them. That's one way uh, to do that. But I'll close the presentation with uh, this speech that was made on the um, Senate floor the day of the Parkland shooting. This is Senator Murphy of Connecticut, and he has been deeply involved in this, of course, because Newtown was in his state, um, and he was there on the day um, when, I believe he was in the room when they informed the parents um, of their children being killed. Turn on your television right now. You're going to see scenes of children running for their lives. What looks to be the 19th school shooting in this country, and we have not even hit March. I'm coming to the floor to talk about something else, but let me just note once again for my colleagues that this happens nowhere else other than the United States of America. This epidemic of mass slaughter, this scourge of school shooting after school shooting. It only happens here not because of coincidence, not because of bad luck, but as a consequence of our inaction. We are responsible for a level of mass atrocity that happens in this country with zero parallel anywhere else. As a parent, it scares me to death that this body doesn't take seriously the safety of my children. And it seems like a lot of parents in South Florida are going to be asking that same question later today. We pray for the families, and for the victims. We hope for the best. So that's, of course, the sentiment um, that uh, many of you have been hearing in the streets and from the students since then is enough never again, et cetera. Um, with that, uh, I know there are a lot of other issues involving gun violence and access and licensing and so forth, so um, Jill and I are more than willing to take your questions or concerns, so who wants to go first? Yes. Notes. Hello. Yes. Okay, that's how I sound. Uh, the senator used the term epidemic. The CDC has been unable to investigate the epidemiology of this. Can you talk a little bit about that? About the CDC's inability to investigate? Yes. Yes. There, there's um, several years ago uh, in the 90s when we had a rash of mass shootings, the uh, Centers for Disease Control and actually the National Institutes of Health 
began investigating gun violence as a public health issue um, because of the amount of money spent um, on gun victims in hospitals. And this was following a path similar almost to when we had smoking and what smoking was doing to people and the economic impact that was having on states, but also as a public health issue. Um, some folks feared where that was leading. Um, they, they thought that the CDC would get into advocating one way or another. Um, so there was a bill in Congress that, uh, it's called the Dickey Amendment, which um, prohibits the CDC from funding research grants to colleges and universities, and usually the people who would do this type of thing, to study the causes of gun violence and to study possible resolutions. Um, some people believe it was because they didn't want it to come to the conclusion that guns do play a role in gun violence, but we, we don't know. Um, so there is some research that still does go on. Some states, including California, have their own institutes for gun violence research. Uh, we lobbied Texas to do that a few, a few years ago when they wouldn't even talk about that. But um, there, uh, so that's why, basically, we, we really cannot do a big nationwide study where we track every um, casualty and what caused it and what round was used and what gun was used because it's just not, it's just not possible. And, and for example, there are also prohibitions on, uh, you know, gun shows and, you know, how many guns were sold, what types of guns were sold, that, that um, data cannot be released by law. So that's part of kind of an institutionalized barrier in the federal system that um, we have to get around. And just okay. one quick follow-up if yeah. I can. Can you speak about the Laudenberg Agreement? I'm sorry? The Laudenberg Agreement or the Laudenberg Act, the one that prevents anybody who's committed uh, any sort of domestic violence from owning a firearm? Yes, yes. The, the Lautenberg Amendment, basically, in the background, because we talked about the connection to domestic violence, and there is a certain com connection there. Um, it, it includes folks in the system who have been convicted of domestic violence, including a, mi a misdemeanor conviction. They're supposed to be in there, and they're supposed to show up. Uh, that's very valuable, but there's a lot of loopholes in that as well that need to be closed. For example, it needs to be a spouse or a family member. If you're living with your girlfriend or boyfriend, it doesn't count. If it's a stalker from your high school, it doesn't count. And so there's a lot of people that slip through that. And, and it, if you have a protective order against you, for example, if you hit your wife or your kid, um, then you need to be reported to the system because... You're, you're forbidden from seeing them until a judge says it's okay. But if you have a temporary restraining order, which most of the orders are, I say you stay away from your wife until the divorce is settled or something like that, you are not reported into the system. And um, we have had cases where, um, I believe there was a case in Austin not long ago where there was someone under a temporary restraining order. Um, they were not reported into the system. They bought a gun. They killed their wife, um, killed, I think, her brother. I mean, it does happen. So one of the things we need to do is close that loophole big time because it, it's a different world now, and you have all kinds of different families and different relationships, and um, the studies just continually prove this link between gun violence and domestic violence uh, is very real. And I think um, over... Now, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's over 50% 50, over 50 of women that are killed in homicides are killed in the home by a spouse or significant other with a gun. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge, huge problem. Okay, next. Any other questions? Yes. Um, this one out for you. Uh -huh. Probably a softball, but, you know... Uh, the, there's been a lot, the, the president has been talking about this and he's obsessed with the idea of arming teachers in schools. And I, I heard him at a, they were at a meeting at the White House with some senators this afternoon and he was talking about, you know, about this idea and he kept saying, well, these people are cowards. All these shooters are cowards and if you, uh, if you arm some of the teachers, they won't want to go in there which I thought was really strange because most of these people are suicidal, so, so surviving didn't seem to be, you know, 
something that, anyway, <laughs> put that aside. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about the idea of arming teachers, which a program we are doing with the Marshalls program here in Texas, and of course on this, and also if you could talk about campus carry, which I think might be of particular interest sure. to our students. Sure. Um, the idea of arming teachers is, again, it is legal in Texas through a Marshalls program where you have to get a license and you have to register with the state. The state claims that more than 100 schools in Texas have at least one marshal, which would be a coach or a, an administration or a teacher that conceals carry on, on campus, but they won't release the actual numbers, so we're not really sure on that. But uh, overwhelmingly, um, teachers, teacher groups, organizations, people that we hear from are really opposed to this because I have some very good friends who are teachers or former teachers, and they said it's hard enough to get anyone to entertain the idea of being a teacher these days because you don't get paid enough, and it's hard enough. So why would I want to also be an armed security guard? I mean, that's just... And so then you would put into this equation classrooms where teachers have guns in them and then other classes where they don't have guns in them and so does that set up an imbalance within the school where some kids are safer than others or are they more danger than others because their teacher has a gun? I mean, it, it, there's a lot of talk about that and some states are adopting this on the state level and Texas already has. Uh, we do know that in central Texas very few schools have marshals but um, it's, again, I don't think if our goal is to prevent gun violence in the first place, that's, that's, prevent, that's encouraging maybe the end of the violence or the shootout, but in my mind, that's not preventing the actual thing. Because as you mentioned, these are people a lot of times that aren't stable, and so their goal is to die at the end of this. So that may be. Jill, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I just, the, the data show that even trained law enforcement have a hit rate of less than 30% when they use their firearm in a, um, in a situation they're addressing. So you can imagine a teacher who gets whatever level of training, license to carry level of training in Texas, we can't expect any higher than that uh, hit rate. And then a lot of law enforcement that I talk to uh, get very nervous about not knowing who the good, the good guy is. And if you, can imagine, um, if you can imagine going into a situation, my son's in high school and taller and bigger and smarter than I am, and uh, not being able to identify who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, uh, it's, just, it's just not a good idea. And if you saw any of the video after Parkland that some of the students shot, they were in the classroom for 45 minutes, an hour, and then the SWAT team comes in, and they don't come in like, okay, guys, time to go. They come in guns drawn, and they say, everyone, put your hands up now. And anyone that had anything in their hands, whether it was a phone or anything, it's like, drop that right now. So I know Art Acevedo, who used to be the police chief in Austin, was really opposed to this idea because when police arrive on the scene, if they're told there's a man with a gun, Okay, that's what they're looking for usually. And, um, you know, that's not to say that I, I, I'm going to be realistic and say there could be benefit, of course, um, and that a good Samaritan might be able to take one of these guys out. But it's very risky. You might, I would think there would be a high likelihood of students being caught in a crossfire. Um, and again, when we're talking about guns and using guns, it's just not for every person. And so that's where I think the difficulty is in that. Any others? You Any other? about campus carry. Oh, campus carry. Okay. I see a video about that at the beginning of every semester. Yeah. All our, the professors have to show them the video. Campus carry was actually instrumental in the formation of this group. And John Woods, who I told you about, whose girlfriend was killed at Virginia Tech, was a grad student here. And uh, he was involved in fighting campus carry and um, helped form a group that later became. Texas gun sense, but argued against it at the legislature and held it off for three sessions before it finally passed. It was instituted on the state level for, for public universities. Um, private universities were given the option um, to opt out, and I believe all but one mm -hmm. opted out. Um, this then, the following year, became effective in community colleges, such as here. And that's because they're often decentralized and 
they thought it would take some additional time to, to um, plan uh, where they were allowed and how to carry and so forth and so on. So um, we haven't had uh, too many dramatic incidents here yet. We have had, you may have read the news last week, that twice at the University of Texas in the same week, someone left their gun in a bathroom in the stall, I believe. And someone came along and found this loaded gun in the bathroom. It, it's just, it's going to happen at the time they said, oh, that that would never happen. But it's going to happen just because it's natural, you know, human beings. We've had that. We've had some accidental discharges on campus uh, that luckily did not, um, did not shoot anyone, uh, did not injure anyone. But that's always been, a, you know, a fear. One thing is that we don't really know if it's effective in deterring crime or sexual assault on campus because we're prohibited by federal law from studying that. So that's another thing that's going on. But I think the, the campus carry over time is something that we'll continue to learn more about as we go. But thank you for that question. Anything else? Yes? Sorry. That's okay. Okay. Brought up police officers. Uh -huh. Well, there's been a lot of shootings that involve police officers, and we have this problem with that as well. Mm -hmm. Police officers didn't typically have AR-style weapons until after the large bank robbery in California. Mm -hmm. Hey, there we are. There we yes. go. So do you have any discussion about how police officers are being trained or perhaps disarming police officers like they've done in uh, the U.K. over in Britain? where only specialized units will actually carry firearms to reduce the number of police shootings against predominantly people of color? I think it's something that's, uh, you know, that's still a new idea across the country, although the impact of uh, the semi-automatic weapons and the very large, uh, powerful weapons um, is something that police do wrestle with in a variety of ways. They feel they need to have the firepower to match an assailant uh, on the other hand, they also still feel outgunned. I, the state of Texas this past session approved $20 million to buy new bulletproof vests or Kevlar vests for police officers around the state because the vests that they had no longer worked because um, the bullets coming from an AR-15 were at such a rate of speed that they were going right through the vests that they had. Also, there are some of them that still, they don't believe their patrol cars are safe because those bullets can pierce the cars. Uh, and also helmets, when they're responding to an active shooter situation, they would like a, a helmet that can withstand the rifle round as well to go in. That, same, that also goes for fire and EMS responders. Our EMS here in Austin has been wanting um, some protective gear for quite some time, but they just haven't been able to get it. Um, so it is something that there's, there's this cost, this rippling cost that goes out. If, if we're going to have weapons like that in, in the society, then the police have to be able to match those weapons, and they have to be able to protect from them as well. So it's very expensive. Sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. Don't be sorry. So that just kind of sounds like the increasing militarization of the police and how that was a very big problem that continues to be a big problem. Don't you feel that that's kind of a negative thing? Well, it's, uh, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, the, the militarization or the need for militarization kind of, police will say it's because, look, we could always have someone, we could always have a Parkland, we could always have a Las Vegas shooting incident, so we need to be prepared for all of these events um, because we have to be able to get through, we have to get the first responders through, and that takes a lot of firepower and protective wear, et cetera. I think it's the, the way they choose to use it that is also an issue. Um, perhaps don't bring the tank-like vehicles out to a demonstration just when you need them. But anything else? Yes? Question. So um, in, with saying this, do you think that schools should take more precautionary security measures for this sense? I mean, the guns are going to, it's going to mm -hmm. take a long time to mm -hmm. figure this out, and especially the mental aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So do you think, I don't know. No, um, you're on. Okay. I can't hear myself. Um, do you think schools should start to increase security because of I, all of this? I think there's no question that um, 
that they should and what form that takes. I think it's up to each district, but um, it, it's, it's sad to think that we're going to need to go through medical metal detectors to go to, to class. And that is probably, it's going to end up that way in almost all public places at some point. Um, one, one of the issues we have is a lot of schools are, are older facilities. I know that the, the high school my son goes to here in Austin, it was built in the 80s. It's not all in one building. It's spread out. It has 17 different entrances that they try to keep locked. Um, but you could force your way in. Uh, they had a safety audit recently, and they failed it. Uh, just because the campus was so spread out. And a lot of districts around the state have those situations. So that's a big investment to upgrade the security. Let's say if you want to do the swipe badges or cards or, you know, my son's school has an issue where in certain academic wings, all the doors lock from the outside. And we heard at Parkland that um, when everyone was on lockdown, parents had, or teachers had to unlock the classroom doors to let students in or else they would have died. At my son's school, they'll have to go out into the hallway, I, I mean, it, to relock the door to close it. And that's just something that people didn't foresee. And if you're talking about you know, changing the locks in a school and upgrading them, it ends up being a lot of money that districts don't have. But that's one thing, and we're going to discuss our legislative agenda at some point, but maybe we can work with the state on giving more money for schools to upgrade their security. The, the issue of resource officers in the school or police officers in the school, I'd much rather have a police officer in the school if you're going to have someone with a gun versus a teacher. But then again, that's very expensive as well. We just we would have to figure out a way to fund that. I think it's worth investigating it. But sure, I mean, all of our lives in public are going to change. From all mass gatherings, this is a possibility now. Uh, the movie, the library, uh, a place like this. Uh, I mean, it's something I know that I think about it all the time. And not that you guys don't look great and happy, but of course I think about, well, what would I do? And I don't like having to think like that. Growing up as a kid, I didn't think like that, but I think we're all gonna have to think that way now. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes? You were talking about uh, pretty much when a police want more. Why don't we stop focusing on the tools and start more so training the person? Like, you can give me all the tools you want, <laughs> Sure. I promise you that. Sure. But when we more focus on the training, like, hey, if this is going to shoot you, we do have a police officer on scene, he's not going to miss nine out of ten shots, and he's going to bring that shooter down. When we necessarily go away from, hey, let's not worry about what equipment they do or they don't have, mm -hmm. the training to do their job, because whether it happens once or never happens, that's their job to protect. And, and if I'm understanding, the, the question correctly, the, your, the, the case of the deputy in Parkland who didn't go in. I mean, that, okay, I, that was his job, and, he, and I'm sure he was trained to do that. But if he had a handgun and you're hearing that going on inside, I don't know what I would do, but that's why I'm not a police officer. So obviously, if you're a police officer, they do. And I know one of the things, I'm also in the Austin Public Safety Commission, and one of the things we talk about is the, um, uh, the shooter protocol that they have. And they do drill into officers that now the protocol is when the shots ring out and you get there, you go right in the building. You don't wait for SWAT to get there. You don't, you know... Hopefully they have the right vest and equipment, but you go in there and you confront the shooter immediately and you try to take them down because even if you don't take them down, they'll be preoccupied with you and that will help others get away or it will slow him down. And I think police departments are going to that more often. But then again, I mean, I'm sure he was hearing that going on in there and he was wondering, well, gee, you know, maybe I have a wife or kids. So it's, it's hard to... It's hard to be judgmental, but then again, he was a police officer, so that was part of his job. Any other questions? Does, there we are. Doesn't it kind of seem like at a point it's going to be security theater similar to what the TSA is doing at the airports? I mean, we have police officers who 
failed to respond in the moment of need. It wasn't just one, apparently it was four. That's the, the rumor is that there were, yeah, a total of four. They wanted to wait probably for the city to get there because they were a little better equipped, I think. That could have been what was going on there. But yeah, I mean, we are looking at the possibility of a TSA type of security at most public events. And, and that's, you know, that will change our lifestyle dramatically, I Yeah, think. it seems like the antithesis of a free society to not be able to go anywhere in the public without being scrutinized by some form of law enforcement or something else saying, do you have this on you? And then what sort of slippery slope that might be? And that's what part of the, the, the dramatic impact of these mass shootings, I think. Mm -hmm. they, they're not only attacking those victims individually, it's kind of attacking our freedom and our sense of safety in, in a public place. And that's hard to give that up. I think there was a question over here. Just, I would add, while we're moving the microphone, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not a law enforcement, I couldn't be, I don't think, I don't want to be, yeah. but you know, imagine the situation in Texas and other states where there's very lax gun laws, you have to assume everyone's armed. I mean, imagine the consequences of that, you know, a police officer coming to a situation and has to act as if everyone is armed. That's, that affects their way of approaching a situation, too. Yes. OK. Uh, is it on? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, first of all, my name is Teddy. I'm a student here at Austin Community College. I just wanted to thank you guys for coming. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, what role do you think we need to What percentage of blame do you think we need to put on the mental health institutions and the mental health professionals? Because being somebody who uh, I am high functioning, autistic, I have Asperger's syndrome, um, I think it's easy to uh, just blame, you know, the gun makers and stuff and everything. But I think we need to hold the um, mental professionals at the state level more uh, accountable. And why do you think that that is, it seems like it's such a kind of taboo topic with the government, like that's like they just don't even want to go there when it comes to mental health. Jill has um, so. many years experience in this area, yeah. so I'll let yeah, her. Yeah, that's an excellent question, and I would have planted that question if I had thought to do so. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that I worked five sessions uh, on mental health and substance use disorder advocacy, and I'm, I am a person with serious mental illness. And... People with serious mental illness are much more victims of crime than the general population is victims of crime. They commit a much smaller percentage of crime uh, compared to the general population. That doesn't keep us from asking questions about situations in which the person, you know, we analyze the situation and find out that yes, indeed, the person had some unaddressed um, mental health issues. One thing that you should know in Texas and just about everywhere, <clears throat> it's a very high bar to be committed um, against your will to a mental health institution. And if you thought about it for a minute, you'd say, that's a good idea. I don't want people saying I'm acting a certain way, they're gonna come and get me and institutionalize me. That's why the lethal violence protective order to me is so important. Because you want that bar to stay high but the best predictor of future behavior is current behavior. And if the person is saying and, and uh, accumulating weapons and saying things that are frightening neighbors and law enforcement, this is an interim step where you can address the guns and make the person safe if they need to seek treatment. If a judge who's issuing that lethal violence protective order can also tell that person they need to get treatment as part of getting their weapons back. I think that's a perfect way of, well, nothing's perfect, but of, of addressing the situation. And it's very frustrating to me and many others when we see, oh, you know, the crazy guy with the gun. The, uh, pl please don't always jump to that conclusion and wait for the facts and then know that the vast majority of people with mental illness are law-abiding uh, and victims more often than others. And that, that as far as funding for mental health care and screening, a big issue, and I know in Austin, is um, one of the ways we could catch some of these kids is mental health screening and counseling in the public schools. 
uh, because they don't have access to that care through their home or they might not have a good home situation. But it is very expensive for the district to fund uh, mental health professionals in the schools. I know in my son's high school, they have one um, for a few days a week, et cetera. But when my son was in middle school, they had a girl commit suicide, which was a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. She was pretty popular. Everyone knew her just in shockwaves through the school. And they had counselors come in for a week afterwards and talk to people. But then they lost the funding for their counseling person and they didn't have one on campus for the rest of the year. So that kind of thing that the state, Texas, and the way Texas funds mental health, and I'm sure Joe will agree with this, it's just not, it's not as high a priority as it needs to be. And, and people will say, oh, it's the mental health system, or they'll say, oh, that nut job got a gun and shot someone and all that. But there's a lot more follow-up that needs to happen, and maybe that's something... You know, maybe a lethal violence protective order could help with that, but, you know, that funding of just general mental health care uh, in general would help. Any other questions? Yes, you can follow up. And thank you for that. I think it's, it's sad because as a society, we are quick to say, well, some, you know, some nut or some cuckoo got a gun, but somewhere along the line, somebody had to have dropped the ball in not helping him for them to get that gun. Absolutely. And I think um, being a San Diego native and being born in California, I did not know that um, about California, but once again, you know, the state of California, as they consistently have, um, have, for lack of a water, better word, the balls to, you know, address something that may not be popular. Mm -hmm. So thank you both for your time. Thank you. One question I'm just interested in this, I've never done this before, but has anyone here in this room either been affected directly by gun violence or do you know anyone that's been affected by gun violence? And that could be a crime suicide or anything like that, and you don't have to raise your hands if you don't want to, but um, there have been rooms where I've been in where a lot of people raise their hand there, and, and um, you know, they, that kind of brings, when you're talking about mental health, that issue of suicide. It's one of the problems with the suicide issue is it's still kind of swept under the rug with shame. Two people in my neighborhood, one on one end of the block, and one on the other end of the block committed suicide within a year of one another. And the guy, every time we'd go out and walk the dog, he'd be out working on his car, saying hi, seemed like the happiest guy in the world. Committed suicide by gun at the same, you know, up the street. That happened, but, you know, the police came out. It was really hush-hush. No one talked about it and so forth. There are, as the statistics show, a lot of suicides out there and you may not hear about them. I know that people may have it in their family or they're aware of it, but we also have to be a little more open about the problem and the need to seek help and kind of that shame aspect involved with mental illness in order for people to get help. Any other questions? I think we're doing, yes? Uh, I had a question about the points of sale on a gun. If someone's selling- Could you speak up just a little bit? So I had a question about the people selling the weapons. Yes. So if they find the person who's purchasing the weapon like um, has like at risk of endangering other people, do they have any rights that say they, they, didn't, or no, they yes. can't sell and, them the weapon? Yes, and I'll tell you one thing. You will know that um, some gun sellers or federally licensed sellers out there, you know you've got a real responsible gun dealer out there when he'll tell you what his protocol is for when someone like a kid comes in to buy a gun and sure, they may be the legal age, but they look them over, they ask them questions, they pay attention to the way they're dressed, do they look like they were homeless, do they seem like they have it all together, et cetera. And if they don't feel that, they don't have to sell it to them. Now, uh, one story I can tell you is a, a, um, a woman on our board of directors, her name is Leslie, her son has is institutionalized right now. He has severe mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia. And uh, when he was at home, 
lots of problems. Well, when he turned 18, he became fascinated with firearms. And he bought gun after gun after gun and just amassed this arsenal, and it scared them to death. They called police. Austin police said, sorry, there's nothing we can do under the law until he does something. Um, they were scared to death of him. Um, and, and according to her, he was so obviously out of it and mentally ill that anyone could notice it. And he had at McBride's gun store here in Austin. They turned him down. They said, we don't feel confident selling you a gun. So he goes down to Cabela's, and that's where he was buying his guns. Well, it turns out that he killed his father. He did not use a gun. He stabbed his father and killed him. But anything could have happened. She was afraid that he could take his guns out and commit a mass shooting or something like that. But, you know, props to the gun sellers who pay attention to that type of thing. They have every right to deny a sale to someone based on something like that. But, you know, if you're going, if you're looking up someone on Craigslist and going to the parking lot, they're probably not as um, discriminatory. They're, they're probably not paying as much attention. But any other questions? Can I just say one more thing? And I know people, thank you to those of you who have stayed. You probably want the rest of the pizza. I don't know. <laughs> but one issue that I am, I've talked to board members about that I want to address better through Texas Gun Sense, and I'd like to see the national organizations address it better too, is um, race and gun violence. Um, one caution that a person's been talking to me a lot about, teachers having weapons, et cetera, we don't want to feed the school to prison pipeline. It's a huge issue for people of color in Texas and elsewhere. We have to figure smart ways to educate people and protect people who are disproportionately impacted. We talk a lot about mass shootings. A lot of them tend to be um, people who look like me or younger, a lot younger. Um, but African-American males suffer hugely disproportionately gun violence. So I don't have the solution. And I invite you to have the solution and help me with it. But I, I like to raise that issue just so you know that we don't ignore it, but it's something we need to work on. And one other final note is thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you. This is, in, you know, you can talk to your friends about what you learned today, and hopefully some of you are a little bit more educated today than you were when you're going to watch the news. When they're talking about bump stocks, you'll know what they're talking about and, and all that. But, um, you know, the outrage that's come since Parkland, especially by young people, is what's driving this conversation. And I firmly believe that in the long run, the high school kids and some of the folks your age are going to remember who stood up and tried to stop this and who stood by and tried to excuse it. So if you have the time to get involved, to pay attention to the news, to call your state lawmakers, even your local lawmakers and your congressmen. It doesn't matter if you live in a gerrymandered district or not, to just tell them, hey, I want you to support that bill or I want you to support better background checks. It may not pay off today or tomorrow, but I'm firmly convinced that a lot of these people who think we just should do nothing, they're just kind of standing in the doorway. And I, I saw one of the kids from Parkland on uh, NBC the other day say, hey, these people need to realize we're going to outlive you. So get with the program. <laughs> and that really does start with you all. And hopefully you can take this knowledge and go forward. But thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.